Next book. Final Fantasy VII, The Story Third Installment. Genre, Fantasy Slash Adventure. Author, Emerald Princess of Vernia. Words, 196,676. Rating, K+. Status, Complete. Summary, the third and final installment of a complete novelization of Final Fantasy VII. This installment covers Janon to the end of the game. See installments 1 and 2 for the rest of the story. Please read and review. Episode 1, Prologue. Prologue. In the darkness, the planet cried. Its cries could be heard by all those lost to the life stream, or by those with the ability to hear. Those who heard its cries described it as mournful. Mournful of the pain it had suffered at the hands of those who lived on it. Mournful of what would happen. Mournful of what it knew it must do. Cloud sat alone in the darkness. He let the darkness sweep past him, even through him. Maybe here, in the endless darkness, he would find where he truly belonged. The light of the present hurt too much he could never return there. Cloud let his head fall onto his knees and closed his eyes, ready to sleep forever. Cloud! Cloud! It was Tifa's voice that called to him. Her voice was a dagger through his heart a reminder of the life he could never go back to. So he stood and turned his back on the light, and walked the lonely path into the shadows. Tifa could only watch helplessly as her friend vanished into the dark. She tried to run after him, to bring him back, but the shadows soon swallowed him up and removed him from her sight. Weakly, she fell to her knees and stared into the shadows where Cloud had gone. Deep down, Tifa blamed herself for what happened. If she had told him sooner, maybe this wouldn't have had to happen. But how could she? How can you tell someone you care about? That they might not be who they think they are. Even as the darkness flowed around her, Tifa cried, wishing that Cloud would come back. I didn't know what to do, she cried. I was always like that. Her memories strayed back to the day that Cloud Strife arrived in Midgar. Tifa entered the Sector 7 train station. Barrett was late from an errand again. The Seventh Heaven had been receiving bad press due to Barrett's temper and lack of self-control, so Tifa had sent him out to keep him out of her hair. But he was running late again, so she went to the station to wait for him. Something odd was happening when she arrived. The station guard and his dog were by the stairs standing beside a handsome young man who had collapsed after getting off the train. He had an unusual glow in his eyes and was very pale, as though he had been sick recently. A large sword, dented and stained, lay by his feet. What's the matter? The guard asked, giving the man a nudge. The young man lifted his head. He stared groggily at the guard his spiky blonde hair falling damply around his face. His eyes were wide with fever. He tried to speak but could not form the words. I was all he could manage. His head fell limp to his chest. Poor kid, said the guard, looking down at the spiky-haired young man. Oog. The young man moaned. Quickly Tifa ran forward, pushing past the station guard. The guard recognized Tifa as one of the residents of the slums and thought she would knew better how to handle the ailing young man. He walked away, his dog following closely at his heels. Are you all right? Asked Tifa, kneeling down beside the man. Hearing her voice, the young man slowly raised his head to look at her. Tifa stared at his eyes, bright blue with an eerie glow. The man stared at her strangely, his mouth moving though no sound escaped his lips. His head lolled to one side and Tifa feared he was going to die right in front of her. But the young man recovered himself and lifted his head again, looking into her eyes and fighting to stay there. Oh oh! Uh! F. Uh. Uh. Tifa. Tifa jumped, 
startled. How did he know her name? The young man winced, breaking Tifa from her thoughts. He moaned and shook his head. Then he looked up at her again. Tifa? He said again, this time with a little more strength. Once again he groaned painfully and shook his head, as though he had a terrible headache. Suddenly he stood up, moving so rapidly that Tifa nearly fell back. The man stood up straight and looked at Tifa, a smile on his face. He flicked his hand through his blonde hair. Tifa! He said excitedly. Tifa stared at him. Did she know this young man? There was something a little familiar about him. Where did she know him from? Not from Midgar she would have seen him before. Nibelheim, perhaps? The flicker of a past memory appeared in her mind and she remembered. She had almost forgotten that boy. Oh, Cloud. She said after placing the name. The man nodded. That's right. I'm Cloud. Tifa smiled, glad to run into an old childhood friend. Is it really you, Cloud? She asked, to be sure. I never thought I'd find you here. Cloud nodded again. Yeah, it's been a while. What happened to you? Tifa asked him. You don't look well. She added, noting his pale face and sweat-damp hair. Yeah? Said Cloud, confused. It's nothing. I'm okay. Tifa turned away, suddenly feeling that something wasn't right. He had been very sick, unable to speak properly, on the verge of death even, until a few moments ago. Now he was standing and talking as though nothing had happened. While Tifa's back was turned, Cloud suddenly grasped his head. His body shook with pain. When Tifa turned back, however, Cloud had returned to normal. How long has it been? Asked Tifa thoughtfully. The question made Cloud twitch. Suddenly he moaned and grabbed his head again. Tifa watched, her eyes sad. She shook her head. When Cloud stopped shaking and was able to speak again, he answered. Five years. Tifa stared at him. Did he even remember he was sick? Cloud shrugged dismissively. What is it? He asked, noticing Tifa's worried gaze. It's really been a long time, answered Tifa, smiling softly. Actually, it's been seven years. You got your wish and joined Soldier, quit after the Sephiroth incident, and now you're a mercenary. You told me a lot about what happened after you left Nibelheim. But, something's wrong. I felt there was something strange about the things you talked about. All the things you didn't know that you should. And other things you shouldn't know that you did. I wanted to make sure. But then I heard. You were going far away. And I didn't want that. I didn't know what to do. So, I thought I needed more time. And that's why I told you about the avalanche job. I wanted to be with you, watch you. Tifa closed her eyes and cried. End of chapter. Episode 2, Part 10, Chapter 01 Part 10, Weapon Strikes Chapter 1 The first thing Tifa noticed when she came around was the glare. The harsh glare of light that seemed to come from nowhere, yet everywhere. It burned through her eyelids and into her soul. Tifa moaned softly and turned her head away from the glare, wishing it would stop and let her sleep. It continued to burn through her, bringing her to consciousness. Opening her lips, she breathed softly. The air was warm. As she breathed, she came to realize that someone was beside her. Ding! 
Hey. Came a voice. The voice came from the person who sat beside her. Tifa flexed her fingers, and then curled them into her palms. She knew that voice. It was deep and baritone, speaking unusually softly and filled with concern and worry. She could not place his name, though. Sadness overwhelmed her. She had hoped it would be Cloud's voice that awakened her, but inside she knew that it would not be his voice. Tifa began to open her eyes winced against the harshness of the light. The glare. She said quietly, aware that her voice sounded dull and unnatural in the unending light. The person beside her spoke again. You'll be better soon. You've been asleep for a long time. Tifa turned her head to face the man who spoke. She had been asleep. For a long time? How long a time? Opening her eyes only a little, she could just make out the shadow of a large man sitting nearby. The bright light obscured most of his image from her, but she could see just enough to make out who he was and remember his name. Closing her eyes again, she let her head roll back to face the ceiling. I'm... Hungry. She said, suddenly becoming aware of how hungry she was. She was becoming more aware about other things, too. Like how stiff and sore her body was, and how she was lying on a hard bed with nothing but a firm pillow beneath her head. Questions began to run in the mind, but she could not focus on them for long. Beside her, she heard a faint, amused chuckle. The man quickly stopped himself from laughing further, and dropped his voice to a serious level. Hey, why don't you ask? Getting up off his chair, he looked at Tifa and added, about him. The glare faded. Tifa opened her eyes and stared up at the ceiling fan in dim lights, unmoving. Then she pushed herself up by her elbows and propped herself by her hands. She shivered, feeling the air suddenly go cold. Finally, she raised her head and looked at Barrett. Because I'm scared, she said. Don't worry, Barrett told her, his voice unusually quiet. I don't know what happened to Cloud either. Seeing the fear in Tifa's eyes, the big man paused and scratched the back of his head. Guess I shouldn't be telling you not to worry. He shook his head. None of them know if he's all right either. Tifa looked down at her feet. He's still... Alive, right. Barrett nodded. Tifa took in a deep breath and sighed heavily. After taking a moment to swallow her fears for Cloud and push them aside, she looked up at Barrett. How long? Was I asleep? Less now. Said Barrett, thinking for a moment. Must be even about seven days. What about Sephiroth? You ain't over it yet, said the big man gravely. Tifa looked at him questioningly. Barrett crossed his arms and explained. Remember that huge light, in the northern cave? Since then, the crater's been surrounded by a huge barrier of light. Everyone knows Sephiroth sleeps in that big hole, protected by the barrier. We can't do a damn thing about it. We just gotta wait till he wakes up. And on top of that, some huge monster called Weapon's been on a rampage. While Barrett was talking, Tifa swung her legs over the side of the bed and let her feet touch the cold floor. She still wore her diamond-studded battle gloves, she noticed, although one diamond was missing on the left glove, and others were chipped. They would need replacing, though it would be cheaper to simply buy a new set of gloves. Shame she liked this particular pair. She had almost forgotten Barrett was speaking until she heard him mention Weapon. She looked up. Weapon? She asked. Remember that huge monster that was with Sephiroth, at the bottom of the crater, said Barrett. They say it's some legendary monster from the past. Monster? Yes, she did recall that a little. Her memories of the events at the Northern Cave were somewhat sketchy flashes of images she could just about put into some sensible order. She remembered the giant monsters flying out of the crater. The collapse of the crater, when the crystal holding Sephiroth fell from its nest and into the shadowy depths below. Cloud looking down at her sadly before the rain of Mako broke through the nest and swallowed him up. Tifa bit her lip. She hadn't meant to think of Cloud. But his face. His voice. His eyes. They were always there, in her mind. Try as she might, she could not close the veil to block him out, even for a second. Not that she wanted to forget him. There were other things, things more important than him, which she had to focus on. Like Weapon and Sephiroth. Cloud. He would have to wait. For now. Closing the veil just enough to shield him from her mind, but leaving enough of his image to make sure she did not forget about him, Tifa turned to Barrett. Weapon. Is protecting Sephiroth. 
she asked. Barrett shook his head. Dunno, he admitted. But he's up here going around tearing shit up. Right now Rufus is fighting it. I hate to say it, but he's got guts. Tifa slid off the bed and stood up, brushing herself off. While she brushed herself down, Barrett walked slowly across the room, close to the shuttered windows. He sighed. We should have been the ones to destroy it, but we ain't got no time. Time? Tifa repeated, thinking. Suddenly, she looked up. Hey. How about me, dear? Barrett stopped next to the last closed window. He looked at Tifa gravely a silent warning for her to prepare herself. Tifa came to stand beside him. After a moment's pause, Barrett pressed a small button at the base of the window. There was a resounding click and the three windows began to open. The metal shutters covering the window slid up, letting a sea of orange-yellow light flood into the room. Tifa raised her arm to cover her eyes as the warm light fell upon her face. When her eyes adjusted she gazed through the open window and looked to the sky. She gasped. The sky she looked upon was not the same sky she saw just days before. The normally blue sky had changed into a burning hue of orange-red, making it seem as though the very sky was on fire. The moon was visible in the daytime sky, brought to light by the burning clouds, though the moon itself was just a dark disk covered in shadow in a sea of orange. But there, directly above them, was the most terrifying sight that Tifa had ever seen in all her twenty years of life. Meteor hung high in the sky, enveloped in a shroud of flames. It was five times larger than the moon and grew bigger with each passing day. It seemed so close and so large that it made Tifa's heart shudder in fright. There was no doubt in her mind that Meteor would fall onto the planet. This was the power of the Black Materia. Its power had drawn this blazing fireball from its path and had brought it on a direct course with their planet. This was what they had fought so hard to prevent. Fought so hard. And failed. Tifa lowered her gaze. She could not stand to look at Meteor any longer. Meteor would fall, that was certain. Was it too late to stop it? She clutched at her shirt and felt her quickening heartbeat. Almost choking in her fear at the sight of the descending fireball, she looked at Barrett. Do we have to give up? She asked him. Barrett looked back at her. The same fear was in his eyes. That scared Tifa, perhaps more so than the sight of Meteor above them. Even Barrett, once the leader of a prominent resistance group in Midgar and who was prepared to kill Shinra soldiers for the sake of revenge on his hometown, was afraid of this. Yet, even as he looked at her, she saw him fighting that fear. Dunno, the man answered finally, turning his gaze away. Tifa watched him in silence. This fear was a battle that Barrett would fight alone. As she watched him the door behind them opened, and Rufus Shinra walked into the room. He entered alone, something that struck Tifa instantly as odd. The Shinra president rarely went anywhere without at least one of his loyal employees around. There was an immediate rise in tension as the president entered the room. Barrett stiffened, instantly on edge in the presence of the most important man in Shinra. He may have praised Rufus less than a minute ago, but that did not mean that the hatred between them was gone. In turn Rufus looked at Barrett in disdain. No, Tifa thought, he was not likely to welcome them with open arms. Rufus stopped next to the bed. After seeing that Tifa was now awake, he crossed his arms and looked at them. I thought Cloud would show up to save you all. He said. He sounded disappointed. Professor Hojo wanted to check up on Cloud, too. What are you going to do to Cloud? Demanded Tifa. Sephiroth's alter ego. Muttered Rufus quietly. He shut his eyes and looked at the ground, lost in thought. Meteor has been summoned. Essentially, it's all but over now. So, there's no need for you now. He opened his eyes. His cold blue gaze met Tifa's. No, he added, almost sinisterly, maybe there is an important task for you. As if on command, Heidegger walked into the room. He moved with a weighty swagger of self-importance, and had such a large, smug smile his beard had difficulty hiding it. He chuckled as he walked. Rufus seemed to be expecting him, for he did not react when the man entered. When Heidegger spoke it was with such a loud, booming voice that anyone on the corridors beyond would have heard him. President! Preparations for the public execution are complete! Barrett's jaw fell open. He snapped round to face Rufus, his face turning red in his growing rage. Execution! He bellowed. What are you gonna get by executing us? A wicked smile spread on Rufus's face. He seemed amused by Barrett's anger. You are to be executed for causing this situation, he said plainly. 
People are ignorant. They'll feel better as long as someone is punished. Barrett's fists shook with anger. He was almost spitting in rage saliva flecked his lips as he struggled to find words strong enough to use against the young president. The words escaped him there were none strong enough to pierce Rufus's arrogant armor. So he stepped back, swallowed most of his anger, and looked at Tifa. I take back what little praise I had for this dem jackass, was all he could say. Again Rufus smiled. He seemed very amused indeed by this display of sudden aggression. He ran a hand through his blonde hair, brushing back the longer lengths that fell in front of his eyes. Well, he said smoothly, letting his hand fall, enjoy your last moments together. With that, the Shinra president left, leaving a stunned Tifa and Barrett alone in the room with Heidegger. Once Rufus left the room, Heidegger turned to the two former resistance members. The same wicked smile was on his face. He got a distinct pleasure out of seeing them squirm over their inevitable fate. I'll tie your arms now, he said as he approached. It did not take long to restrain the two of them. Barrett attempted to fight back, threatening to take down any soldier who came near him. It took three soldiers to hold him down while the handcuffs were put on, and powerful restraints were tied around his arms to keep them placed firmly behind his back. Tifa did not resist at all. She stood in silence as the soldier locked the cuffs around her wrists. Heidegger took charge in leading the two out of the room where Tifa had been resting and down the stairs toward the execution room. Tifa and Barrett followed in an almost subdued silence, though they held their heads high in supreme defiance. A single soldier followed close behind, his rifle ready in case there was any resistance. After descending a few floors the troop entered the main control room. This was where Heidegger left them, moving away from the group and rejoining Rufus, who had entered just ahead of them. The man followed the president as he went to the front of the room and stopped by a large window that made up the front wall. As she walked silently around the back of the control room, Tifa turned and glanced out of the window. Beyond the large glass pane she could see an open plain of crystal blue waters. The ocean? Tifa thought quickly. If they were by the ocean, then they were most likely in Jinan. Jinan was the only seafaring town she knew of that had a Shinra base. Why were they in Jinan and not Midgar, she thought to herself. Surely Rufus would have returned to Midgar, not Janon. While she was lost in her thoughts, the soldier behind nudged her back with the butt of his rifle. Tifa turned to him defiantly, but could see nothing behind his dark visor. Turning her back on him, she hurried to catch up with Barrett. The soldier led them on until they finally arrived at their destination. As they walked through the large double doors they were hit by the sound of chatter and high-pitched laughter, bright lights and the scent of expensive perfume. A number of chairs had been lined up in the center of the room. A number of people holding microphones were scattered about, and there were others holding cameras. Tifa looked around in puzzlement. What was going on? The laughter came again, cutting above the sound of the chatter. Tifa groaned. She recognized that laughter. Only one person could make piercing laughter that high-pitched and ear-grating. Scarlet The crowd of journalists parted as Tifa and Barrett were led into the room. Sure enough, the Shinra executive was there, smiling and laughing heartily with a couple of the journalists. Scarlet turned. There was a smug smile on her thick, red lips, and her eyes peered at them in disgust through layers of black mascara and eye shadow. Her dress was neatly pressed, her nails delicately painted. She had certainly prepared for the occasion. This was a moment she was going to enjoy. Scarlet's eyes stopped on Tifa. The smile widened, revealing such perfectly clean teeth that Tifa felt dirty and common. She scowled back at the executive. How much she wanted to wipe that smug, arrogant smile off that old witch's face. Scarlet looked at Tifa a moment more, before she turned to the array of journalists gathered around her. Is everyone here? She said, her loud voice reaching every corner of the room. She gestured to the two handcuffed prisoners. These are the ones who brought this madness into the world. A number of cameras turned and swiveled round to face them. Barrett looked left and right, squinting in the bright lights that were cast over them. Staring at the journalists, he said, The hell are these people? We will be broadcasting your miserable deaths live on national television, Scarlet replied, without a hint of shame. Clearly, she did not care for her audience to hear her describe their deaths as miserable. One of the journalists, dressed very oddly in a tight suit that clung to his bizarrely short and rotund body, stepped up to Scarlet. His unusually small, hunched head made him especially odd-looking. Scarlet, he said in a slightly high, accented voice, why a public execution in this day and age? 
Scarlett ran a hand through her slick blonde hair as the cameras revolved to face her. After pausing for a second to create a dramatic effect, she said in a smooth, almost charming voice, with the chaos resulting from the meteor reports, we desperately need to rally public support. It's better that we punish somebody, anybody. You make me sick. Tifa spat harshly, glaring at Scarlet. It was almost unbelievable that this woman could be so cold. Ha, 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 ha. Laughed Scarlet, touching her lips delicately with her fingertips as she winked knowingly at the journalists. They'll never admit it, but everyone loves this stuff. Placing one hand on her hourglass hips, she spun on her high red heels and pointed at Tifa. We'll start with this girl. Barrett raged. If you've got to do it do me first. He roared furiously. He strained his muscles against the cuffs and restraints on his arms and wrists. They did not budge. If only his gun arm was free. Then he could shower bullets on this useless excuse for Shinra justice. The avalanche leader's outburst and furious attempt to break free of his shackles seemed to amuse Scarlet. Her red lips parted into a white grin as she waved excitedly at the cameras, motioning them to turn and record what the man was doing. Camera, this way! She exclaimed as she waved. Make sure you get this, the audience just eats up tearful goodbyes. There was nothing Barrett could do as Scarlet led Tifa away. He watched helplessly as Scarlet and a soldier led his friend to a closed door at the far end of the room. At one point Tifa turned her head and looked back at him. Her eyes were ablaze she hadn't given up yet. Barrett was relieved to see her look so confident in the face of death, but it didn't stop him feeling that he was to blame for her being in this situation. The soldier unlocked the door, and Scarlet ushered Tifa into the room. It was small, only a box room. It contained only a single chair, with strong metal locks on the arms. Hanging down from the ceiling were a number of pipes a gas chamber. Tifa stopped and looked up at the pipes. They stopped directly above the chamber, ensuring that the gas, when flowing, would fall directly over the victim locked in the chair. She swallowed nervously. Seeing her pause, Scarlet shoved her hard toward the chair. Tifa staggered, but kept her balance. She spun round, glaring defiantly. What are you doing? Tifa snapped. This is my special gas chamber, explained Scarlet, waving her hand leisurely toward the chair and pipes. She stepped forward until she was almost nose to nose with the younger woman. Take your time, she said, her voice low and sinister, and enjoy a slow, painful death. The soldier, previously standing by the chair, came up behind Tifa and unlocked the handcuffs that bound her wrists. Tifa locked gazes with Scarlet. Suddenly Scarlet reached out and pushed her. Tifa staggered backward. Her heel caught the hard edge of the chair and she fell into the chair, her head banging on the metal back. While she sat there, dazed, Scarlet and the soldier each took her wrists and placed them into the locks on both arms of the chair. They flipped the metal cuffs over and they clicked into place, preventing her from leaving the chair. Tifa looked up to find Scarlet standing over her, leering down at her with her usual haughty smile. Stuck up cunt! Scarlet hissed, before giving Tifa a harsh slap across her face. Scarlet and the soldier left the gas chamber, leaving Tifa sitting in a stunned silence. As the soldier passed, something slipped from his pocket and fell to the floor. He did not notice and left the chamber behind Scarlet, pulling the door shut behind him. The automatic lock sealed the door the moment it clicked into place. As she heard the click that signaled the door's locking, Scarlet sighed in satisfaction. Rubbing her hands together, Scarlet faced the journalists who stood eagerly in front of her. Well now, the show's about to begin, she announced. She laughed heartily. All of a sudden the siren sounded, cutting in over the sound of Scarlet's irksome laughter. The emergency lights began to flash, bathing the room in a cloak of red light. Barrett, his arms still in chains, looked around wildly, while the journalists stared at Scarlet in bewilderment. Before she could speak, a computerized voice boomed over the siren's wild blaze. Emergency! Emergency! Weapons approaching! Attention all military personnel, take your positions! One of the journalists jumped and dropped his microphone. Oh no! He wailed, quivering with fright. It's weapon! Run! The man turned and darted toward the door, almost falling over his feet in his panic. The remaining journalists followed suit, dropping their things and fleeing for the exit as fast as they could. The cameraman, taken over by terror, left their camera behind as they tore out of the doors after their cohorts. They did not even take the time to stop the cameras from filming. Only two soldiers and the bizarre-looking journalist remained, his small head turning left and right wildly. 
Scarlet, stunned by the suddenness in which the events were occurring, could only stare as the journalists fled. Hey, hey, all of you! She shrieked, but her voice was drowned out by the siren. Furiously, she stamped her heel on the ground. Damn! Why now? She cursed. When she looked up she saw that the bizarre journalist stood in front of her, his unusually large microphone ready in his hand. How does it feel now, Scarlet? He asked her. He leaned forward, holding his microphone close to Scarlet's face. Scarlet smiled in approval. Hmm, so you didn't run? She asked. I'm impressed. She took a deep breath, and the man leaned in closer. How do I feel? Right now. With the siren roaring overhead, Scarlet was unable to hear the betraying hiss of gas as it seeped out of the top of the man's microphone. As she spoke she swooned, dizziness and lethargy suddenly overcoming her. She tried to look at the man, but he was blurred and fading in her sight. Then her eyes closed, and she saw no more. Barrett stared as Scarlet suddenly collapsed to the press room floor. At first he thought she was dead. Then he saw her chest rise and fall she was fast asleep. Hey! Sleeping gas! He said, shaking his head. He looked at the journalist. The journalist was looking back at him. Barrett stared intently at his face. There was something familiar about him what it was, he couldn't be sure. Suddenly the man spun around, grabbing the suit and pulling it away from him in a single movement. The suit fluttered to the floor. In the journalist's place was a large round mug, with a mechanical cat sitting on top of its head, looking at Barrett through slender slit eyes and a cheerful, happy smile. Cat she. Weirdo. Cat turned. Until that moment, the two soldiers guarding the door had been watching the events unfold in disbelief. They had seen Scarlet fall but did not move, uncertain as to what they should do. But as they saw Cat reveal himself they jumped up and ran toward him, their rifles ready. Instantly Cat sprung into action. Guiding the mug forward, he charged at full speed at the advancing soldiers. The nearest soldier skidded to a stop. He hesitated, and that was his fatal mistake. Cat barreled forward, using the mug's speed and weight to carry him forward. He crashed into the soldier, who cried out in surprise and pain as the mug trampled over him. Standing on the soldier's stomach, the mug brought its huge fists down on his head. The Shinra soldier gave a stifled groan before his head fell back. The rifle slipped from his hands. With the first soldier down, Cat turned his attention on the second one. The next soldier was a few meters behind the first, kneeling on the ground as he took aim at the cat. Cat waved his arms frantically before darting to one side, just as the soldier fired. His quick reflexes allowed Cat to dodge the bullet, leaving it to skim the top of the mog's head. The mog jumped up and down madly, seemingly in pain. While the soldier reloaded his rifle, he scanned the room for the cat. There was his fallen companion, Scarlet, the hysterical mog, and the stunned prisoner. There was no sign of the troublesome cat anywhere. Where had he gone? He walked cautiously forward, continuing to scan the room. A dark shadow fell from above and landed on his helmet. The soldier began to look up when something hard and heavy smashed onto his helmet. The soldier stiffened and dropped his rifle. The heavy object was smashed again onto his helmet and he fell to his knees. One more whack and the soldier tumbled forward to the ground. Cat jumped off the soldier's shoulders as he fell, spinning his microphone actually his megaphone in disguise in his hand. The cat looked at Barrett and smiled. Barrett could only stare in wonder. Words escaped him which, for Barrett, was quite a first. Of all the people to rescue him, he had never thought it would be this mechanical feline. He tried to speak, but all he could do was open and close his mouth voicelessly. As he stood there, Cat climbed back onto his mock and calmed it down before bounding over to stand behind Barrett. I'm here to help, said the Cat. Leaning over, he used his sharp claws to unlock Barrett's handcuffs and restraints. The chains fell to the floor. Barrett found his words at last. Why you? Ain't you part of Shinra? Cat scratched his head nervously. Let's just say I'm against capital punishment. Besides... He added, nodding his head toward the sleeping Scarlet, I hate this broad. Come on, we gotta help Tifa. I'll keep watch at the entrance. While Cat hopped over to the entrance, Barrett ran quickly to the gas chamber doors, nearly running over Scarlet as she lay sprawled on the press room floor. Barrett grabbed the door handle and pulled on it. To his surprise the door did not budge, nor did it even rattle. He pulled again, harder, but still nothing. He tugged hard and shook the handle. Nothing. 
It won't open. End of chapter. Episode 3, Part 10, Chapter 02. Chapter 2 It's weapon. There have been so many attacks lately. Can we handle it? I believe so. Your orders. Rufus turned his gaze to look through the giant glass wall that was the front of Janan Shinra HQ. Beyond the wall was the sea, calm and tranquil, its color tinted to reflect the deep orange hue that had taken over the sky since meteor summoning. The ocean waters seemed still with barely a ripple, giving no trace at all of Weapon's presence. But appearances were deceiving. Weapon was beneath the surface, Rufus knew. A smile tugged at his lips as he looked upon the water. No need to ask, was all he said. Beside him, Heidegger grinned. We'll give it a shot from our big cannon, he said, and turned to face the three sailors who were standing nervously behind him. As he turned the sailors stood at attention, awaiting their orders. Open cannon doors! Heidegger roared, making them jump. Activate cannon! Target, weapon! At his command the sailors nodded and ran from the control room, bellowing out the orders to all those who could hear. The words spread quickly all through the room and the rest of the building. Pretty soon, the main headquarters was alive with bustle and activity as employees typed furiously into their consoles, shouting commands and confirming actions as they completed them. Satisfied everything was in order, Heidegger turned back to Rufus, who was watching the events through the window. Outside, Janan was preparing for the imminent attack. The upper town had been evacuated, leaving only Shinra soldiers who ran around preparing the city's defenses. Metal plates as thick as trees rose in front of the buildings on the road facing the docks. Giant hooks held the plates in place, securing the buildings against any heavy attack. This defense would hopefully hold against weapon. A segment of the main road dipped and was pulled back to slide underneath one of the buildings. The resulting gap contained a hidden cannon, another one of the city's defenses, which rose up from beneath to stand in its place. The cannon was pushed to its full height, settling over the road. The long metal barrel swiveled and twisted this way and that before finally settling on the ocean ahead. The cannon seemed just a mere toy when compared to Janan's main weapon. Another cannon, it was built into the front of the Shinra HQ and made up the majority of Janan's upper levels, almost matching it in size. The powerful steel pistons that held the cannon upheaved and groaned as they strained to push the cannon up and turn so that it faced the ocean. Switches that lined the cannon's side flipped down, marking the cannon as active and ready for battle. The two giant pistons that held up the barrel groaned and released gusts of piping hot steam into the air as they lowered the colossus barrel so that it pointed into the waters ahead. Janan was ready for battle. Preparations complete. A sailor announced, running to Heidegger. The man nodded. He did not turn but stood alongside Rufus, glancing at the young president's face to see what his orders were. Rufus's eyes were fixed on the ocean, his lips set in a thin line. A slight nod was all he gave. Heidegger raised his arm. The cannon. Fire. He shouted, and brought down his arm as the signal to fire. The cannon fired. The shock caused the cannon to jerk backward so violently it made the entire upper section of Janan shake as though an earthquake had gone off beneath. Black smoke and red flame poured from the cannon's mouth. The projectile, burning hot and imbued with the power of Mako energy, shot rapidly through the air toward the ocean. It moved swiftly, at a steady downward angle, not once wavering or faltering from its course. A long tail of pure Mako, so hot it burned white, blazed behind it, leaving a sparkling trail in its wake. The projectile headed far into the horizon before finally hitting the water. A loud explosion shook the ocean. A shockwave, causing by the crushing impact of the projectile, spread out across the waters. It was followed just seconds later by a second shockwave, this one in the water itself, spreading out from the point of impact and deep into the ocean. The waters it left behind were flat, without any ripple or swell. It was as though the entire ocean had been flattened where the projectile had hit. After a few tense moments the waters eased, and life returned to it, waves rippling gently beneath the scorched surface. In the Janan control room it was as though time had come to a stop. All movement ceased as everyone's attention turned to the sea. The computers were silent, their workers abandoning their work to look up and stare through the window. Rufus and Heidegger stood side by side in silence, not saying a word to one another but simply gazing at the ocean before them. On Janan docks, all was the same. The Shinra soldiers stationed to the docks had ceased all movement. They did not twitch nor turn. They barely even breathed, so focused were they on looking ahead. 
more than a hundred pairs of eyes stared hard at the ocean waters, waiting for some sign of weapon's presence. But the ocean remained still, its waters silent and unrevealing. After what seemed like hours but was only a few seconds tense silence, Rufus looked to Heidegger. Did we get M? He asked, his voice loud in the eerie silence. Slowly and unsurely, Heidegger nodded. Seems so. He whispered. He was about to breathe a sigh of relief when the sirens sounded, so suddenly and so loudly that it made him and everyone else in the control room jump out of their skins. The workers leaped back to their computers, throwing on headsets and typing furiously. Weapon approaching. The alarm announced. Speed, 50 knots. Called one of the sailors from his console. It's heading right toward us. Shouted another. It can't be. Said Heidegger, shaking his large head in disbelief. We hit it dead on. Rufus said nothing. When the siren sounded he had turned his attention back to the window, looking out at the ocean before him. He knew Heidegger was wrong. It could be that weapon had survived the blast from the Mako cannon. Though he knew very little about weapon and what it was, he knew enough to know that it was a beast that would not be destroyed easily. Even as he looked at the ocean now, he could see the far-off ripples that were the telling signs of something large moving beneath the surface. He turned to Heidegger. How about the cannon? He asked. It'll take time to reload, said Heidegger reproachfully. Then use regular firepower in the meantime. Rufus commanded irritably, turning back to the window. Heidegger nodded. Yes sir. He spun to face the soldiers and sailors who had gathered behind him. Open all artillery doors. He bellowed, his voice booming even over the deafening roar of the siren. Target, weapon. Don't let it land. Beneath the ocean's surface weapon swam, its gargantuan body barely visible through the rippling water. The ocean's waters swelled above it like a protective mound, and the lash of its tail created a long line of bubbling white froth that wavered and flickered in its wake. With a sudden surge weapon rose and broke the surface. Its appearance caused the mound of water flowing over its body to split open, sending showers of large and small water droplets to fall through the air and splash back into the sea. Fins the size of a ship's sails rose and stretched up. Sunlight fell on blue-purple skin that was almost metallic in appearance. The large body of Weapon settled heavily on the water and continued to swim toward Janon. Seeing Weapon rise, the commanders on Janon's docks gave the order for the cannons to fire. The soldiers standing on the docks looked up as the cannons above them opened fire. The firings of the cannons made the ground shake beneath their feet and their helmets rattle on their heads. Three rows of cannons either side of the main opened fire upon the approaching weapon. Pretty soon the town was filled with the sight of fire and the deafening roar of the cannons. But each soldier held his ground, holding fast to their weapons and awaiting their orders. The cannon fire appeared to be doing little damage. Weapon continued to approach, even as the red-hot cannon pellets struck its body. The majority of the pellets struck the water around weapon, hitting around it, in front of it, and even behind it. The pellets made the water a churning mass of bubbles and spray, which only served to shield weapon further from their attack. Those that did hit their target did nothing to slow it down, exploding on its surface and barely even scratching it. Instead it seemed to swim faster, preparing to make its final approach. Rufus stared in open-mouthed astonishment as he saw a weapon break through the cannon fire and continue to advance. Even with all Janon's immense firepower raining down on it, the beast if that's what it truly was was still heading toward them. The Shinra president did not wait to marvel at this, for he was already running from the control room, with Heidegger running close behind him. Only the Shinra employees remained, shouting out even as their commanders fled the chamber. Speed, 70 knots. One sailor called. He wiped his brow with the back of his hand. Weapon. Closing in. Shouted another. No good, cried a last one, pointing to the window. It's attacking. The cannons of the upper levels continued to fire. At the forefront of Janon's defenses, a long line of soldiers stood on the main road, anxiously waiting for the signal to fire. One by one they looked to their commander. The commander, seeing the approaching wall of water that was weapon's shield, raised his arm and barked out that the soldiers prepare to fire. At once the soldiers sank to their knees, raising the heavy guns and resting them on their shoulders. The commander waited until the last soldier heard the order and was ready to fire, before shouting out another command. The soldiers then opened fire, firing at will. The bullets from the bazookas joined the endless volley of cannon fire, 
whistling in the air before exploding against the wall of water that bubbled around Weapon as it swam forward. It was a futile effort, for the bullets had as little effect as the more powerful cannon fire that detonated on Weapon's diamond hard surface. Despite the shower of bullets and flame, Weapon continued to surge effortlessly through the water. Only its back and its raised fins were visible through the frothing waters, for it had ducked its head beneath the surface to protect itself against the cannon fire. As Weapon drew closer and closer, it became clear to the attacking soldiers that Weapon was not going to slow down or stop, but ram into Janon with the intention of crushing the cannons and stopping the assault. The soldiers waiting on the lower levels, after seeing that Weapon was not going to be stopped, dropped their weapons and fled from the shore. One young soldier was too afraid to run with his comrades and simply dropped to the ground, hiding his face in the dirt as Weapon's shadow loomed over him. Weapon rose up and slammed into the town. The impact caused the whole town to shake and tremble beneath its ginormous bulk. A giant wave of water fell onto the lower levels, filling the streets with water that swept through the town at an alarming rate. Spray fell over the upper levels and onto the soldiers, who were on their knees and trying to keep from being swept off the road and into the ocean below as the town trembled around them. All they could see before them was Weapon's great back as the beast, after slamming into the town, curled its body up and rolled back under the ocean. The last they saw of the beast was its main fin and tail in the air, the tail swaying as it sank beneath the water and out of sight. End of chapter Episode 4, Part 10, Chapter 03 Chapter 3 As the hull of Janon shook as weapon crashed into the town, Tifa Lockhart was still locked up inside the gas chamber. Chained by her wrists to the metal chair and unable to move, she had no idea what was going on outside. She heard the sirens and the faint sound of gun and cannon fire, but whether Janon was winning or losing, she could not tell. Twisting her body round, Tifa turned to the door, about to shout and demand some answers, but stopped as she heard a hissing sound behind her. She turned back. The hissing came from the large pipes around her. As she realized this, she smelt the bitter, deadly scent of gas. Gas! Tifa squirmed in her chair, striving to pull her wrists free of the locks that bound her. She could barely move her arms. Barrett, help! She called. Barrett's muffled voice came through the metal door. Hold your breath! He told her. Hold on as long as you can! Tifa turned her head away from the pipes. Taking a deep, deep breath, taking in as much free oxygen as she could get before the gas consumed it, she held it deep within her lungs. She could feel the gas blowing hotly across her face, surrounding her, choking her. It would not be too long before the whole chamber was filled with the noxious gas. Tifa twisted her head this way and that and kicked out, her lungs already beginning to burn with the need for more air. Come on! She shouted, her feet thudding against the bottom of the chair. I can't hold on forever! Outside, Barrett continued to pull on the door. His muscles were burning. Sweat caked his arms and face, and the veins on his neck and arms had risen to the surface. He grunted and groaned with the effort, pulling in every ounce of strength he had to pry open the door and rescue Tifa from her horrible fate. He lodged his gun arm into the gap between the door and the handle and pulled with all his might. The door refused to open. Barrett sagged and released the door, his muscles unable to pull any more. The door would not budge, nor was it giving any signs of it ever moving. Barrett snarled angrily and found enough energy to give the door a harsh punch with his good hand in effort that jarred the muscles of his hand and sent painful shivers up his left arm. She! Barrett cursed, more at the door than at his pained hand. He turned away from the door and ran to Cat, who was waiting in the middle of the room, watching him with a thoughtful expression on his furry face. Barrett gestured at the door to the gas chamber. The gas room's probably locked from a different room. Cat nodded absently, as though he wasn't really listening but making up his mind about something. Sensing that Barrett was rapidly growing irate, the cat quickly sat up straight and nodded confidently. Hmm, we gotta go with a different plan, he said. He turned the mug around to face the other door the one leading outside. Let's get out of this room first, he said. Barrett eyed the cat suspiciously. Despite Cat's apparent helpfulness, the former avalanche leader could not trust him completely just yet. After a split second's careful thought, Barrett turned back to the gas chamber and shouted, Tifa! I'll help you, I promise! He then turned back to Cat, who was already moving and bouncing away on his mob toward the other doors. Barrett hesitated, and then ran after him. Barrett caught up to Cat just as the Cat was about to push on the double doors. They swung open with ease. Cat bounded through and paused in the corridor beyond, waiting for Barrett to catch up. 
The instant Barrett passed through the double doors and entered the corridor, the doors suddenly hummed with life and swung shut. Barrett spun around in time to hear a loud click that was the doors locking shut. Running back to the doors, Barrett took hold of the handles and pulled with all his strength. But these, like the door to the gas chamber, were locked tight and refused to budge even a millimeter. No. They locked this too. Barrett cried, glaring at Kat accusingly over his shoulder. From the other side of the door, the two heard a familiar, cackling laugh. Fools! They heard Scarlet say. Now you can save the girl! Barrett stepped away from the door. Clenching his fist tightly, he slammed it hard against the metal. The sound that came from the blow reverberated down the corridor. Above it was the sound of Scarlet's hideous laughter, mocking and reveling in what she deemed her greatest triumph. There was nothing Barrett could do to stop the laughter, or to stop Tifa from suffering the torment of her execution. God damn it! The man cursed fiercely. How he longed to break through these doors and wring Scarlet's skinny neck, watching her eyes go dead as he choked the life out of her. Barrett could not forgive himself. It should be him locked in the gas chamber, not Tifa. How could he have let this happen to her? How could Cloud have left them like this in Shinra's grasp without a hope of saving themselves? Barrett's angry musings were interrupted when he heard Kat's softly spoken words coming from behind him. Okay, okay, the cat was saying quietly, so no one on the other side of the door could hear him. Time for plan B. Let's run to the airport. Barrett came away from the door and looked at Kat in astonishment. Why the airport? He demanded angrily. And leave Tifa there. He jabbed his gun arm at the locked door, where Scarlet's crowing laughter could still be heard over the siren. Cat waved a furry paw dismissively, as though the fact was not important to him. Trust me, trust me, he said with a grin. We gotta take a chance. Without waiting for Barrett's consent, the cat turned and began to hop quickly along the corridor. Barrett watched the cat closely, once again trying to decide if the cat was being sincere or whether there was some sinister, devious side to his suggestion. Cat was the one, after all, who had arranged the kidnap and holding of his adopted daughter, Marlene. Cat was the one who had stolen the keystone from them all those weeks ago and gave it to the Shinra. He was a spy and a traitor. No matter what the cat did to try to repent what he did, he was still an employee of Shinra and thus an enemy. Then an image of Tifa flashed through his mind. In his mind's eye he saw, locked inside the gas chamber and unable to get out. Tifa was coughing and choking, dying so horribly slowly as she was forced to breathe the toxic gas that was consuming her. She was on her knees, clawing at the door with trembling hands. She was crying. Her eyes were red and swollen, bulging out of her head as she clawed for air. Those swollen eyes turned to Barrett, pleading desperately for him to save her. That image was enough to make Barrett's mind up. He left the door and began to run down the corridor after Cat. His pace picked up with each step until he was charging down the corridor, his boots thudding loudly on the concrete floor. He overtook Cat, leaving him behind as he sought to make his way out of this building and reach the airport. He didn't know what plan Cat had in mind, but if there was a chance that it could save Tifa then it was worth a shot. The two left the Shinra building and came out on the main road beside the dock. The soldiers that had patrolled the streets had now scattered. The only people still on the road was a cameraman and a young reporter, who braved the gunfire and splashing water to film a report on weapons attack. Barrett paid no attention to her, though the back of his mind said she looked somewhat familiar. Barrett came to a stop and looked up at the orange-red sky that now covered the planet. Meteor hung like a huge blemish in the sky, forever a reminder of what was to come. For a moment Barrett wondered if there was a way to destroy it to stop what Sephiroth had created. He shook his head. This was no time to be thinking of that. He had to save Tifa. He turned his head away from the sky and was about to run off, when he noticed that the young reporter was standing right in front of him. I know you're in a hurry, said the girl in a high, equally familiar voice. But, please if I could have a word. Barrett raised his fists threateningly. Shoo up! He snapped. I'm in a hurry. Key -e in. At his words the girl jumped back in fright, almost dropping her microphone. She quickly caught it and held it close to her chest, glaring at Barrett. Don't make so much noise, she scolded Barrett sternly. It's me, me. Yuffie. Pulling away part of her disguise, she grinned at Barrett. Barrett finally recognized the young ninja. The hell you doin' here? He demanded. Before Yuffie could answer, a loud explosion shook the town. 
the road shook beneath them, causing Barrett, Cat and Yuffie to totter and stumble. Cat rolled off the back of his mog, catching hold of the mog's back and holding on as the shaking continued. Yuffie's ninja skills allowed her to quickly regain her balance, and she turned to look at the ocean. More soldiers stopped to look as they saw a weapon begin to rise out of the water. The monstrous form of weapon rose out of the ocean, water slicking over its blue-purple body as it rose slowly and steadily. Its head rose, small in comparison to the rest of its body, but no one paid any attention to that. A long upturned triangle of flesh or metal shielded the lower half of weapon's face. Two large yellow eyes with cat-like pupils stared menacingly on Janon. These ominous eyes gazed intently over the town, taking in every sight and locating the vital spots. Yuffie turned away from the docks. Her face was pale. I'll explain later. She said, her voice trembling. Now we gotta get to the airport. Throwing down her microphone to the ground, she began to strip off her reporter's guise and return to her true form. Barrett began to wonder what the ninja had done with her shuriken, when he saw that it was strapped to her leg. Yuffie had disassembled the razor ring when donning her disguise, keeping the pieces close to her body should she have need of them. Now she worked to put the pieces back together even as she followed Barrett and Kat as they ran down the road toward the airport. The group were just starting to think that they would reach the airport without incident when they ran into a trio of soldiers. The soldiers were trying unsuccessfully to reassemble one of the smaller attack units that had been damaged when weapon crashed into the town. The machine, called Death Machine, was smoking heavily and was clearly beyond repair. One of the soldiers looked up as the three companions approached. He recognized them instantly and called to his comrades, who came away from the death machine and picked up their rifles. They opened fire upon the three. The three came to a stop, raising their arms to shield themselves as the bullets flew past them. The soldiers were so nervous as a result of weapons assault that they could not aim straight, and as such were unable to hit the three directly. But the bullets whizzed past at such an alarming rate that they were just as dangerous. The last piece of the razor ring clicked back into place. After spotting a gap in the flurry of bullets, the ninja flung her shuriken away from her. The shuriken zipped through the air in a straight line toward the nearest of the soldiers. It struck the soldier's rifle, jarring it from his hands where it clattered to the floor. The shuriken then twisted around and caught the second soldier in the side of his helmet, stunning him. The weapon then spun and made its way back to Yuffie, who caught it. Barrett was in no mood for nonsense. Raising his gun arm, he took aim not at the soldiers but at the damaged death machine that was smoking behind them. He let loose a continuous flood of bullets. The death machine shuddered as the bullets struck. When Barrett stopped the machine laid still, electricity crackling over its body. The robot juddered and began to stand. With each movement there came the grate of metal on metal, and sparks flew from its damaged interior. It was so alive with electricity that Yuffie could feel the hair on her neck standing on end. But the soldiers, so preoccupied with rearming their weapons, did not notice as the robot lumbered up behind them. Hey, look behind you, bozos. Called Yuffie. One of the soldiers turned. At the sight of the malfunctioning robot looming over him, he gave a petrified cry and dropped his weapon to the ground. Pushing past his two comrades he fled from it, running past Barrett and Cat in the process. The other two soldiers then turned and followed suit, screaming in terror as the broken robot came to a stop, gave another final shudder, and then exploded where it stood. Barrett and his two companions once more raised their arms to shield themselves as hot flames and smoldering robot parts were sent flying through the air. The road became clogged with smoke. The flames were hot against their skin, the smoke choking their every breath. But the wind soon blew the smoke and flames clear and the three ran on, leaping over the charred remains of the death machine as they continued on their way. The rest of the route to the airport was an easy one. None of the soldiers left on the road dared to oppose them. Most of them were too busy doing other things to take any notice of the escapees. Those who did notice were too scared to do anything to stop them. A single look into Barrett's angry eyes and Yuffie and Kat's fierce expressions were enough to send them fleeing back to their commanders. They stormed the building that led to the airport. The few soldiers left guarding the building pressed themselves against the walls in fear as the three charged in, weapons drawn, with Barrett yelling commands that they had better not interfere. No one did, and the three quickly headed for the airfield. Cat led the way over to the cargo lift. Motioning for Barrett and Yuffie to hurry up and get on, he stamped his foot down on the on button. The lift shuddered and began to rise, carrying the three up to the top level where the airships were docked. When the lift finally came to a stop the three jumped off and ran across the platform. A large airship was docked at the far end of the airport. It was the same airship that Rufus and his company had used to travel to the far northern caves and bring them all back to Janon. 
Barrett was surprised to see that there were no guards surrounding the airship. He came to a stop at the foot of the great airship and looked around. After seeing that there were no other paths to take, he turned to Kat. Yo! You sure this is the right way? He asked. It's a dead end. To Barrett's horror, he saw Kat grinning sheepishly and scratching his head. Uh oh, the cat said meekly, whiskers twitching. Did I make a wrong turn? You dumb cat! Barrett raged, shaking his fist angrily. What the hell are we gonna do now? They'll all be coming soon. They were coming sooner than Barrett expected. As he spoke, he heard the sound of soldiers storming the lower levels of the airfield. He heard a Shinra commander bark an order and the lift suddenly began to descend, ready to bring up soldiers to apprehend the escapees. Barrett turned his back on Cat and Yuffie and began to adjust some of the mechanics of his metal gun arm. The chainsaw attachment began to whir rapidly, until it was a blur of frenzied motion. Barrett glanced back at Cat. Yo, better watch my back till the end. Partner. Tifa, meanwhile, was struggling desperately to free her arms from the chair that bound her. She could not hold her breath for much longer. Her lungs burned intensely in their need for air. The gas spilling from the pipes was rapidly filling up the room, consuming every last ounce of oxygen there was. Tifa quickly realized that she could not wait for Barrett to save her. If she did not do something to save herself, then she would die in this horrid gas chamber. Hurriedly Tifa looked around, trying to find something that she could use to free herself, or at least stop the gas that blew around her. There were two large glowing buttons in the room, but she had no idea what they did or if they could help her. One must stop the gas, she knew, but it did not matter for she would need her arms free to reach them. Tifa looked at the rest of the room, scanning the walls and the floor. Her salvation lay just a couple of feet from her, lying on the floor near the base of the chair. Before leaving the gas chamber, the soldier guarding her had dropped a key onto the floor. Whether the key would unlock the chains binding her wrists Tifa couldn't say, but it was her only hope. Tifa stretched out a foot, hoping to pull the key toward her. She could not quite reach it, so she slid off the chair and stretched as far as her fettered arms would allow her. This time she reached it, and, pressing her foot down hard to make sure the key would not slide free, she drew the key toward her. Since she could not use her arms to pick up the key from the floor, Tifa sat back in her chair, positioned her feet around both sides of the key, and attempted to lift it up with her feet. After a few unsuccessful attempts she managed it, holding the key precariously between the sides of her boots. Bending her knees Tifa lifted her feet up to her face and caught the key in her teeth. Her lungs felt ready to explode. Tifa maneuvered the key in her mouth until the jagged edges pointed down, and then she lowered her head to the first lock binding her left wrist. She twisted her head and the key turned in the lock, and then the lock clicked open. Tifa sat up and wrenched her hand free. Taking up the key in her hand she quickly unlocked her other hand, and then thankfully climbed out of the chair. Tifa placed her hands over her mouth. She exhaled slowly, releasing the pent-up air that had clogged her lungs. Cautiously she breathed in, trying to filter the gas through her gloves and take in only precious air. There was little left and she nearly coughed. She swallowed what air she was able to take and then looked about for a way to stop the gas from flowing. Her eyes fell once more on the two large glowing switches the one by the door and the one near the pipes. Which button stops the gas? She asked herself, her voice muffled and faint through her leather gloves. Knowing she had no time to wonder, she went to one of the switches and pressed it. There was a faint hiss and the gas stopped flowing, much to Tifa's relief. Hopefully soon the gas would disperse, but she was still locked in the chamber. Tifa went to the door and pulled on the handle. Open it. The door refused to budge. Tifa sagged, weakening from the lack of air. She was just about ready to give up and let the gas take her when the room suddenly shook violently, causing her to almost fall. Weapon continued to stare at Janon, glaring at the town through yellow eyes filled with hatred and contempt. The large monster finally chose its target. It lowered the large shield that masked the lower half of its face, revealing a large gaping mouth that was not filled with teeth but large, jagged bits of metallic flesh. Weapon lifted its head clear of the shield, its frightening mouth opened wide, and turned it on Janon. A glow began to form deep within Weapon's jaws. The light was faint at first but rapidly growing brighter, filling Weapon's entire mouth, glowing like a beacon in the middle of the ocean. The monster narrowed its eyes and drew back its head as the blaze grew brighter still, and becoming so fiercely hot that the air around it began to waver and ripple like the waters it surrounded. 
When weapon was ready it thrust its head forward, and a narrow beam of blue light fired from the monster's open mouth. The blast was so powerful even weapon struggled to control it, its head shook as it fought to keep the beam under control and on target. The energy beam fell upon the base of Janon's main control tower, cutting a long, jagged gash through the thick metal and leaving a gaping hole in the side of the tower. Thankfully for the town the beam did not burn any further than that, but it left that part of the tower vulnerable to another strike. Weapon was preparing another strike. Its head tilted as it took aim, stretching its monstrous maw wide. The inside of its mouth began to glow brightly once again, so bright even Weapon had to narrow its eyes to protect it from the light. Weapon drew its body back, preparing for the blow. Weapon was just about to fire again when the Mako cannon suddenly fired and hit the monster right in the middle of its hideous face. The monster was forced backward, smoke and flames engulfing the upper half of its body and shards of broken flesh falling to the water. Its two large fins fell limp at its side as Weapon began to tumble over, sinking head first into the safety of the ocean waters. From there it disappeared beneath the surface, either horribly wounded or dead. Gas seeped swiftly out of the chamber, escaping through the yawning hole burned in the side of the wall made by Weapon's attack. As the gas escaped it was replaced by the sweet taste of fresh ocean air. Even though the air was thick with the scent of oil and burning metal, Tifa gulped it down, relieved as she felt the imploding pain in her lungs slowly cease. As the smoke began to clear, Tifa looked up at the far wall. Weapon's attack had created a long gash in the side of the tower, cutting across the gas chamber where she was being held. The bottom of the gash, smoldering with melted metal, lay just a few feet higher than Tifa. The metal around the gash had folded inward, within easy reach of her. Tifa was just about to go up to it when she heard Scarlet's scared but angry voice screeching at her through the door. What do you do? She heard the woman shout. Tifa heard Scarlet pound on the door, shrieking in absolute rage as she realized that it would not open. Hey! Open it! Tifa turned to the door and put her hands on the hips. First you lock me in this weird place, she said in annoyance, and now you're telling me to come out? Make up your mind! Deciding that she was not going to wait around for Scarlet and her cronies to open the door, Tifa hurried over to the bottom of the gash and climbed up onto the metal. The metal was already beginning to cool and was easy to hold onto, and Tifa pulled herself easily up out of the chamber and onto the exterior of the tower. Wind gushed past her, blowing her hair in all directions. Tifa slid down onto a jutting out ridge and made her way slowly across the side of the tower. She took care not to look down not because she was scared, but because she did not want the height to distract her from the task at hand. She reached the edge of the ridge. The only way to go now was down. Tifa sank to her knees and turned to face the wall. Carefully she pushed herself off, sliding below the ridge and onto the curved wall of the tower. The wall was rough enough for her to hold onto and she pressed her leather gloves and boots firmly against the surface to stop her from sliding off and falling to a painful death on the town far below her. After pausing regain her composure, she took a breath and began her descent. Tifa was about halfway down the wall when she heard a shout from above. Looking up, she saw Scarlet standing on the edge of the gash leading into the gas chamber. She was screaming in rage and pointing at Tifa. Two soldiers came out of the chamber behind her and began to scramble over the ridge. Tifa put her head down and began to climb down faster. She kept her gaze fixed on the wall, determined not to let either the height or the advancing soldiers stop her from making her escape. Tifa reached the end of the wall, which joined onto the heavy machinery that held the giant Mako cannon in place. The fighter leapt the last few feet and landed on the machine, which hummed beneath her feet. She did not stop and began to run away from the wall, scrambling over the rises and falls, jumping over the joints and pipes, heading for the barrel. When she reached the barrel she leapt onto it, almost losing her balance on its smooth surface. Tifa finally came to a stop at the far end of the cannon's shaft. She realized her mistake instantly. By coming down the cannon's shaft, she had left herself with nowhere else left to run. Behind her was a sure path right back into a Shinra dungeon, or worse, another execution chamber. Ahead of her was the end of the shaft and a long drop into the raging ocean below. Tifa took a step back away from the edge, preparing to turn and attempt to make a break for it, when she heard Scarlet's insufferable voice coming from behind her. Our little game of hide and seek ends here. End of chapter Episode 5, Part 10, Chapter 04 Chapter 4 Slowly Tifa turned, sighing heavily as she spotted Scarlet walking up the shaft. The woman had her hands on her hips and walked with a definite swagger, hips swaying as she walked up the shaft toward Tifa. 
her expression was a smug one, lips pressed together in a thin, wide smile, eyes glazed in the moment of glory. And she had a right to be smug, for Tifa had nowhere else left to run. The two soldiers walked up a few feet behind Scarlet, ready to catch Tifa if she tried to run. Scarlet stopped in front of Tifa. The woman was so close Tifa could smell her perfume. A nice fragrance, she thought. Shame it was on such an evil witch. Scarlet flicked her hair out of her eyes. The execution may have been unsuccessful, she began, her voice smooth and callous, but your death by falling from here and crashing into the water below might still be pretty exciting. She stopped when she saw that Tifa was not listening. The younger woman was wiping her boot against the back of her leg, her arms behind her back, not looking at Scarlet, making a show of the fact that she was not paying attention. Scarlet's face twitched. Walking up to Tifa, she slapped her hard across the face. Tifa staggered and nearly lost her balance, holding her cheek in her hand. Stuck up to the end, hissed Scarlet. Tifa looked down at her hand. Four specks of blood stained her fingers where Scarlet's long, painted nails had cut through the skin. Tifa looked up, eyes blazing. Quit slapping me, you old wench. Tifa stood straight and brought her hand up, striking Scarlet across her face. She did not draw blood, but she slapped hard enough to make Scarlet fall back. Scarlet brought her hand, trembling, to her face. She winced at the soreness of the skin, and her lips turned down into a fierce scowl. Raising her fist she returned the slap. This time Tifa was ready for her. She did not defend herself but allowed Scarlet's hand to strike her face, making her cheek sting painfully. Tifa did not stagger and kept her balance. The moment Scarlet's hand left her face Tifa caught hold of it with her left hand, tugging Scarlet toward her. With her right hand she then slapped Scarlet repeatedly, literally wiping the smirk from her face. After the third strike Tifa let go and Scarlet fell onto the floor, her hair over her face, her cheek red and sore. God! I can't stand it! wailed Scarlet, sobbing. She spent a few moments pushing her hair away from her face, trying to sort it orderly behind her head. After regaining her composure and trying to restore a little of her glamour, she stood up and faced the anxious soldiers behind her. Take her away, she ordered. As the soldiers came forward, Scarlet turned back to Tifa, the smug smile once more on her face. Now it's time to pay up. I'll really drop you if you don't settle down. She laughed. Tifa grunted as the soldiers came forward. There was no point in her trying to run. She would not make it past Scarlet and the soldiers, and the only other way led to a sure death crashing into the ocean. She was just about to concede defeat and allow the soldiers to arrest her, when she heard a voice speak faintly. Run. Surprised, Tifa looked up and around her, wondering where the voice had come from. The voice was strangely familiar, yet at the same time completely alien and unfamiliar. She looked at the soldiers advancing on her. She looked at Scarlet, staring at her through wild eyes and laughing in delight. None of them had spoken, so who? Run to the end of the cannon. Tifa obeyed at once, turning away from the soldiers and starting to run rapidly down the shaft toward the end of the cannon. She was running to certain death, of that she was sure of, but even if she did die, she would at least die with the satisfaction that she did not die at Scarlet's hands. The soldiers made no attempt to hurry after her after all, where could she go? Then a whirring noise began to sound, faint at first but swiftly growing louder, as though something large and powerful was approaching. Tifa and the soldiers skidded to a stop and looked ahead in complete wonder and surprise as a Shinra airship suddenly rose from beneath the cannon, rising slowly and hovering next to it. Painted in red paint across the side of the airship was the name Highwind, along with a picture of a woman dressed in a red bikini and with long, flowing red hair. Standing on the airship's outer deck was Barrett. The big man jumped up as he saw Tifa, waving his arms at her and shouting for her to run. Tifa complied, beginning to run for the cannon's edge even as the soldiers and Scarlet continued to stare in amazement. The airship began to rise. Barrett took hold of a long length of strong rope and threw it over the side of the ship. The rope slid down the side of the ship, falling past the cannon and swaying barely within reach of the cannon. The soldiers had noticed Tifa was running now and quickly chased after her, trying to catch up to her before she could reach the rope and escape. Tifa glanced over her shoulder, saw the soldiers catching up to her, and tried her hardest to run faster. As she neared the end of the cannon she stretched her arms out, trying to grab hold of the rope as it swayed just within reach. But by the time she reached the end and jumped off, the rope had swayed out of reach again and she fell. Tifa fell, her arms stretched up to the sky as she saw the airship rising rapidly away from her. 
the rope came within reach again and she quickly caught hold, sliding down a good few meters before she was able to get a secure hold. The rope burned through her leather gloves she could feel the heat in her palms. But she did not let go and held on tight as the rope swayed perilously back and forth. On deck Barrett gripped the other end of the rope tightly, determined not to let go and let Tifa fall. He barked out an order and the ship began to move, flying away from Janon and heading out across the sea and into the horizon, carrying Tifa with it. You okay? asked Barrett. Tifa was sat on deck, catching her breath after her terrifying ordeal. Her hands burned from holding onto the rope, and her cheeks stung as a cold wind blew across her face. Her eyes were bleary from the wind so she told herself and she could barely make out the forms of Barrett and Kat as they stood around her. My cheek hurts a bit, she admitted, rubbing at her sore cheek. The bleeding had stopped, though she would have a reminder of Scarlet for a few days. Tifa was not too bothered Scarlet would have marks for a good while longer. Tifa wiped her eyes, and looked up at the two. Forget about that, what's all this about? Barrett looked to Kat, who grinned awkwardly and scratched the back of his head with his megaphone. The mug copied him, almost knocking the cat off his perch. Well, I'll catch the details later, said the cat evasively, refusing to meet either Tifa or Barrett's eyes. In any case, he added casually, the airship, High Wind, is now yours. With that he turned and hopped away. Barrett waited before following him. Tifa stared as the two disappeared through a door. She didn't know what had happened, but she could guess by Cat's guilty expression and Barrett's fierce look that the cat had done something to trick them again. She did not get angry, though. The cat was only doing what he was being ordered to do, after all. It wasn't his fault. Telling herself that this was the case, Tifa headed for the door leading into the ship. She was just about to take hold of the handle when a loud moaning, groaning sound cut through the roaring of the wind blowing through the propellers that powered the ship. Stepping away from the door Tifa turned and looked about the upper deck, until she spotted the source of the slurred groaning. It was Yuffie. The young Wutai ninja was slumped heavily against the rails bordering the deck, her head leaning over the side. Her face was pale, with a green tinge to it, and she had one hand clamped tightly over her mouth as she groaned. Remembering the ninja's abhorrence to travel other than by foot, Tifa kept a wide berth and slid through the door and descended down the stairs leading into the ship. When she walked inside she was hit with choking smell of oil and heavy machinery. The sound of the engines whirring and humming drummed loudly inside her head, making the blood pound. Tifa groaned and put a hand to her head, wishing that the noise would stop. The stench of the oil made her cough and didn't help her already pessimistic mood, but she tried to put all these thoughts aside as she descended the stairs and headed toward one of the bridges where Barrett and Kat were talking. Damn it! Why didn't you tell me you could fly an airship? Barrett was shouting angrily, lifting his voice so that Kat could hear him over the roar of the engines. He shook his head and sagged. I thought... Tifa was gone for good. Cat once again scratched his head and sat back on his mog, resting his feet leisurely on the mog's controls. Sorry, he said simply, but I had to do something to trick the enemy. He sat up and, grasping the controls firmly in his gloved hands, turned the mog around. Come on. Everyone is waiting. The mog hopped away, going up a set of stairs and disappearing through the door. Barrett followed, not noticing Tifa standing at the end of the bridge. Everyone? Everyone is here? said Tifa to herself. For an instant her heart lifted and she tore down the bridge, boots clattering on the metal grating, and leapt up the stairs. She burst onto the deck beyond and skidded to a stop, her heart falling. Everyone was not there. She looked around and saw all of her friends. She saw Barrett and Kat, Barrett heading toward his spot at the front of the deck. She saw Vincent standing with Red 13 on the far side of the deck. They looked up at her as she ran in, Red 13's face looking at her with concern. She saw Sid, standing proudly at the ship's helm. He was looking over the shoulder of a young man dressed in a Shinra Air uniform, criticizing him quite harshly about his sloppy piloting skills. Two more Shinra workers were standing at another console near to Tifa. They glanced at her as she walked in. Tifa looked back. They did not look like prisoners. Sid turned away from the nervous young pilot and spotted Tifa standing near the entrance of the deck, looking around. Putting out his cigarette and putting the half-smoked butt behind his ear, he ran up to Tifa and gestured to the deck. Welcome to my airship the High Wind. Sid announced proudly. Everyone turned to Tifa as she walked forward slowly toward the center of the deck. Her head turned this way and that, looking around without enthusiasm. When she finished scanning the deck she turned to the face the spot near to where Barrett stood, and her face fell. 
that was where Cloud should have been standing. Cloud should have been the one to rescue her, to lead the way. Cloud should be standing there now, telling them what they should do, where to go. Sid watched her as her face fell, and he tapped his foot in annoyance. What's wrong? He asked, his voice harsh. You should be more excited than that. Red 13 looked up at him. Sid. He said softly. Giving the pilot a gentle nudge with his paw, the hound shook his head. Sid stared, then his eyes opened wide as he realized what the hound was saying. He gave Tifa an apologetic glance and scratched the back of his head, bowing awkwardly. Yeah? Said the pilot with a blush. Tifa was paying no attention to the conversation. She continued to look at that one spot at the front of the deck. She could almost picture him standing there with a hand on his hip, gazing out of the window with that serious look he always wore, like he carried the troubles of the whole planet on his shoulders and no one was allowed to help share the load. After thinking about it all for a long time, he would turn to her and tell her it was going to be all right, saying it as though it was nothing. Even though inside, he was being torn apart by his suspicions of the truth. Tifa sighed. There was nothing she could do about it now. After taking one final look at the deck, she turned her eyes away and looked at Sid. Not enough crew, she said quietly. Well, it takes all kinds, said Sid. He nodded his head toward the three Shinra employees that were piloting the ship. So glad you're all right, Tifa, said Vincent. Tifa gave him a small nod. She then turned to Kat, who was hopping up behind her. Tifa, I'll give you information on Shinra, he said. Standing up, he patted his furry chest. Ask me if there's anything you don't understand. Tifa was just about to ask him a question about why he was being so helpful when she felt a large paw pat her leg. She looked down to see Red 13 standing next to her. He gazed up at her with his one good eye and asked the question she had been dreading answering. Do you think we aren't strong enough without Cloud? He asked. Do you think we can't save the planet alone? Sighing, Tifa went to the front of the deck. She pressed her hand against the glass wall and peered out at the ocean as it rushed by. They were on an airship owned by the Shinra, flying to who knew where, without a clue what to do. She turned her eyes from the water and looked up at the sky. The skies were darkening to a deeper orange as day headed into night. Even Meteor was beginning to fade now, swallowed up by the darkness of night. But it would return again when the sun rose. Meteor is coming, she began, her eyes fixed on the evening sky above, and Weapon is on the rampage. At a time like this, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. No idea at all. Sighing again, she closed her eyes. Get a hold of yourself, Tifa, said Barrett. He turned to the others gathered on the deck except for Yuffie, who was still on the outer deck praying she didn't lose her lunch. Come on, let's think about this. No way we can get off at this train we're on. If only Cloud were here, everything would be fine, said Tifa softly, just loud enough for the others to hear. Cloud would. Stand that cocky little way he did, and tell us what to do. He'd say everything's under control, Tifa. She smiled at the memory. Tifa! When did you become such a wimp? Snapped Barrett. Tifa came away from the window and turned to Barrett. I'm sorry Barrett, she said. I'm kind of shocked myself. I'm so depressed. And Tifa? Barrett added, his expression softening a little. The reason why we all thought it was Cloud was because... I know, interrupted Tifa, cutting him off. She did not need Barrett to remind her that it was because of her everyone believed that the spiky young blonde with the glowing Mako eyes was the real Cloud Strife. Even then, she was not totally convinced. That's why I want to make sure. That's why I have to see him again. Cheer up, Tifa. Said Red 13 kindly. I want you to know I didn't dislike him, said Sid to Tifa, taking his half-smoked cigarette out from behind his ear and popping it in his mouth, holding it firmly between his teeth. Gotta admit he was a strange dude. Just when you thought he was cool, he'd go and do some damn fool thing. He took out his lighter and lit the cigarette. And when you thought he was smart, he'd show how stupid he was. He took a deep puff. Everything about him from his movements to his speech were kinda odd. Knowing what I do now, I can see why he was that way. Well, as long as you stay alive, you just might see him again someday, so cheer up, sis. Tifa thought about what he said, and then nodded.
I'll be able to see him again someday, she said, this time with more confidence. Sid took his cigarette out of his mouth and pointed it at the ship's controls. A thin trail of smoke rose from the tip. If we can find out where he is, the high wind will get us there in no time. Maybe. Red 13 sat back on his hind legs and yawned widely. It had been a very long day. Even his flame-tipped tail refused to twitch it was so exhausted. Cloud is still stuck deep in the north crater, where the ground cracked and swallowed him up. Buried in the depths of the underground. Deep within the earth. Tifa repeated. Are you talking about the life stream? Red 13 nodded. The life stream sometimes gushes out to the surface from cracks in the ocean floor. I heard that such a place exists. Maybe, just maybe clouds. The hound was cut short as the high wind suddenly shuddered and dropped a few feet in the air. The young pilot operating the controls screeched and gripped onto the joystick hesitantly, bringing the airship back to level flight. Why a a a The young pilot yelled. Captain Sid. Sid sighed and put out his cigarette. He turned to Tifa. Tifa, sorry, but I've got to show this moron how to land the ship. Don't worry, it'll be done in a minute. Oh, and Tifa. He added, giving Tifa a stern look. No matter what your goal is, you've got to be prepared. Go to your room and get ready for our operation. So while Sid coached his new apprentice in the skills of piloting a large airship, Tifa left the deck and headed down to the conference room in the midsection of the ship. There she sat in silence, her head in her hands, trying to decide where to begin in her search for Cloud. End of chapter